So we're in our sermon series called I Lead. And um, today's sermon is never lose your eye. I lead, but you cannot lose that eye. And the scripture we're going to end up with may be a little different than you think. It said, for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Clarification. It did not say don't gain the world. I want you to get gain the world. But don't lose yourself in the process. I want to show you what it means to never lose your eye. A leader's greatest asset is their ability to be versatile and adapt in various situations. So, uh, Brother Martin, I know you are mechanically inclined. Can you see these? What is this? It's a flathead screwdriver. Can you see this? What is this? It's a Phillips screwdriver. What is this? It's a screwdriver. But it's got everything that this has and this has. God is, he labeled this by what it does. It's a flathead. It can only fit flat screws. He labeled this by what it is, the Phillips. It can only fit the kind of round kind of screws there. This one can do it all, and it was hard to label it. You're going to move into a season where you're going to stop being one-dimensional. Yeah. And you're going to be multi-dimensional. You're going to be on your job, and it's requiring one thing, and a curveball is going to come, and you say, switch. I ain't quitting. I got that in me. Oh, you got some more? I got that in me. I got everything in me that the situation demands because I have my eye. My eye is my identity. Here's the thing about this, the reason why God has to switch many of us, because many of us are like this flathead screwdriver. We are willing. We will do whatever you ask us to do. The only challenge is in order for us to do it, every screw in this building has to fit this. And the world has to change to us in order for us to operate. And we get frustrated because we can't operate it, operate in certain situations. And we blame the situation instead of looking at, why can't I just change? And you can change your method without changing your mission and who you are. So God's making us versatile in this season. I learned this. Uh, we were talking about fill us up till, our, till we overflow. I'm Pentecostal to my core. I was raised uh, Pentecostal. I, I love I hate even categorizing a move of God as being Pentecostal because it's not confined to that organization. But you find different people who are, man, they'll resist it. That's, that's for holy rollers. You got to get all lathered up to do all the stuff like that. But situation will pull on you different. Man, I used to get uh, joked on, particularly when we were in college. They would say, y'all catch the spirit today? Man, how can you catch the spirit? Did you throw it back after you caught it? And I would go in certain settings. I met people who were from certain reformations, and they were like, hey, man, we're going to pray in the spirit. And I was waiting on, yes, Lord. They ain't ain't do no clapping. They just started speaking in tongues. They said, you can't do that. The Spirit of God has come in, and you got to feel something in your side. I learned how to be versatile in various situations. And I learned that situation pulls on things different than what you ever imagined. Um, We're praying for this couple in our house, and then particularly the man. And I would just, I said, man, do you mind if we're praying God was doing something in his life? Same person used to joke about you catching the Spirit. Laid hands on him. His wife and my wife looked at me, and they said, can you help us? I said, why? He was going out under the Spirit of God. The same one that was making the joke when the power of God hit him. I just had to get in the right moment that what was once funny became a need. There are many of you that Satan is making you doubt certain things and question certain things, but your situation is going to pull on a point where you're going to have no other choice. For instance, there are many people who struggle with, like, man, can God really heal people through me? Let me fall out and no ambulance can get to me. Are you going to let me sit there? Or are you going to lay your hands on my head and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I command life to flow through his body. We are moving in a season where we're all going to be versatile. You're going to see God move in various ways and his gifts and his spirit's going to flow through you in the name of Jesus. If you want God to make you multidimensional in this season, lift your hands and say, God, stretch me. Stretch me, oh God, in the name of Jesus. In order to flow um, and never lose your eye, 
it's composed of many elements. It's not about to, to get your eye back. It's not about taking a vacation or anything like that. You got to understand the, the components that make up your identity and the things that cause us to make an impact on the earth. Here's my main idea today. Your identity is not earned. Your identity is not earned. It can only be received from God, then affirmed and secured by him through a relationship independent, I notice a lot of words, of your performance. Because many of our identity is based on what we do and what we've attained. You ask people who you are. I am an attorney. Who are you? I'm a mother. Who are you? I'm a husband. You got to be more. Those things are the components that allow you to flow in who you are. But your identity is something you receive from God before you ever do anything. So if I make a mistake, I am still who I am. If I win, I am still who I am. I had a tremendously uh, tough season in my life. Uh, I don't know what to think about this, Tanisha. Uh, they ranked us on my job. And uh, you could either be an E, S1, S2, S3, or an N. N, you basically out the door. And uh, I was new, and I, you ever pray for something and God give it to you, and you weren't ready for it? God sent me through a, man, a big learning curve with a job, and I was ranked S3. And I walked in that thing every day with my head down, thinking, man, I am labeled awful. I thought I was stupid. I thought I was dumb. I, didn't, I quit speaking up because of what I was uh, labeled, because of what I was ranked. And it had to take God to show me that who I was was not confined to a ranking. It was not confined, watch this, to what man thought I was or how I performed. I could perform because I knew who I was in Christ Jesus. Can I say, just speaking of Jesus Christ, can I show you how he received his identity? He got baptized by John the Baptist. And the Bible says a dove ascended from heaven, and there was a voice, a loud voice that came from heaven. And here's what it said. This is my beloved son. His, he's my, it's his identity. He's my son. In whom I am well pleased. My security, I own him. Not own him in terms of controlling him. I claim him. I'm not ashamed of him. He's my son. That's his identity. In whom I'm well pleased. Affirmation. He affirmed Jesus before he healed the sick. He affirmed Jesus before he raised the dead. He affirmed Jesus could endure the shame of the cross because his father told him in front of everybody, this is who you are and this is what you're going to be. Your identity is not based on the degrees on your wall. It is based on what you receive from God. And I am a man of God through Jesus Christ. Any children of God in here? When you live this way, I'm telling you this, particularly as a leader. Your identity, you live from your identity versus for an identity. Right. Money doesn't define you, and I want you to earn as much as you can. Yes, sir. Your, your gifting doesn't define you. It comes from who God says you are. A believer's identity cannot be corrupted or altered. 1 Peter 1, 23 is one of my favorite scriptures. Mm. Having been born again. How many born again? Oh, yes. Am I born again in here? Oh, yes. If you're not, we can get you born again. Except Jesus, as the best decision you ever made. Having been born again, this is us, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. Through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Meaning, once you're born again, and God says, this is who you are, your mistakes can't change your identity. Your successes, you cannot be more loved from God because you want 100 people for, to the Lord. Versus if you don't win anybody to the Lord. You do those things from a place in God, not trying to prove something, but because you have something. And as a believer, you and I don't have to be in competition because we all have the same spirit inside of us. It just works in different ways. I need you to get this. I need you to say this. Look at your neighbor and say, you are not my competition. Find somebody and say, you are not my competition. Can you imagine what would happen if we start competing with each other and start completing the mission that Christ that gave us that said you this and I'm this and together we can put 10,000 to flight. One can chase a thousand. The Bible says two can put 10,000 to flight. So I'm never losing my eye because I receive my identity through Christ. It cannot be corrupted. As long as I stay in fellowship with him, I'm flowing from his authority and his power. That makes sense in here. I wanted to establish that your identity before we move forward, because your identity makes you versatile because you got to identify with the right thing 
You want to involve people in your life. You want to have influence, ingenuity, so you can make an impact in this world. I'm going to close my sermon with a question at the end. I'm going to just tell you that the Lord asked me through these scriptures in Luke chapter 9. Turn your Bible. You can look at me on the screen. We're going to be in Luke chapter 9. The first thing about your identity to be versatile is your identity starts with identifying with the right thing. In life, you will identify with a whole lot of things, but those things don't have to be your identity. They can be your accomplishments. My, I didn't pledge to my senior year. My senior year of college, I pledged Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. And one of the things that this guy set me down and talked to me, he said, don't, if you know anything about Greek organizations, he said, don't let the, the letters make you, you make them. The reason why that's so important, because some people pledge and lose their mind. There are people who are nobody. I mean, none of them are somebody. But they walk around obscure, obscure on campus, and then they put some letters on their chance, chest. And young ladies that ain't never paid them attention, all of a sudden love that you're a Greek. Or your identity is in the fact that you play a sport, or you're smart, and you label yourself that way. When you do that, you become something that you're not. I don't care what you are in life. You got to know who you are before you start to accomplish anything, because if not, that accomplishment will become your identity yes. or that failure will be your identity. I am a man of God before I do anything. Yes. I was a great pastor before I ever started pastoring this church yes. because everything that God calls is great. I am just as great as a man with 10,000 members. I don't have to bow down to anybody because when God made me, he made me well. Here's the challenge. What I do with that calling is on me. You all right in here? Yes, sir. That's why many of us get arrogant in the big head when God starts to bless us. Well, we walk around here. I remember when I used to have $5 in my account. Yes, I, I remember when I was a young chap like you. I, I remember when I was trying to figure it out. And now that you arrive, you have this arrogance. As if you don't still have the same struggles, the same thoughts, you're just a little further down the road. The reality is this. If you don't know who you are before you have success or failure, both of those will define you. And here's the good news. If you don't know who you are, your real identity is waiting on you. At any moment in your life, you can discover this is who. And it is not anything like a soul-searching thing that you got to. Go on this year-long journey to do it. You know what it simply is? Accepting the fact that you are a child of God. I am God's child. He's not ashamed of me. He died for me before I was born. He claimed me. And when I receive that, tremendous things start to happen. But you got to identify with the right thing because there are a lot of things trying to identify you in this time. There are a lot of causes. Hear me real good. Y'all gifted. Y'all talented. There are a lot of people whose causes will try to pull you in to use your influence. Make sure everything that you connect to that you know what you're connecting to because you don't want anything to use your influence that God didn't want you to be a part of. There have been a lot of things, organizations that tried because they knew uh, the influence that I have, that I'm an African-American guy. So this is, this is what it is. There's organizations that know, say, hey, we need a minority to be a part of us. Well, I'm not going to be a part of it just because I'm a minority and you want to get other minorities. I want to believe in the mission. If I wasn't this color, if I was the same color as you, would I go for this? Right. You got to know what you're connecting to before. And it works the other way around. As an African-American church, I want man, people of all uh, nationalities in our church. I can't just go handpick and say, hey, Brother Matthew, we need this. And I want you to be a... No, he has to believe in BFF because we're BFF. That's right. It has to be an authentic connection that we make. That makes oh, sense in yeah. there. But none of these authentic connections happen if you don't know who you are. Oh, Jesus was having some discussions. And you figure Jesus, he had to know who he was. But he was having discussions with his disciples in Luke, in Luke chapter 9. Can we go into that conversation for a minute? He knew who he was. He says, now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? Jesus wasn't insecure. And he's asking, who do they say I am? And you imagine him looking at each other like, you, you really want to know what they're saying, Jesus? You ever had somebody ask you the question, and you're thinking, do you really want to know the answer to this? Yes, sir. Like, I, can you really handle the truth? And they said, they answered and said this. Some said you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah. They all had significance in the kingdom. Others say you're one of the prophets of old that is risen. And then he said, all right, I understand what they say. But he said, who do you say that I am? Peter stood up and said, thou art the Christ. 
son of the living God. It's not in that translation. I got a question for you. Who do you say he is? I know what the world defines. I know what they say, but who do you say that he is? And Jesus went on and said, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. So he began to deal with Peter because Peter had a revelation, not information. Peter knew who he was. Something changes when you get to know he's Christ. Something changes when you get to know what salvation really means. That, that word salvation means healing. It means prosperity. It means deliverance. It was more than me walking down the aisle and accepting Jesus Christ as my Savior. When I got salvation, I got the anointing of God. I got the healing of God. I got everything that I'll ever need. I'm a walking, living, versatile being. I can do whatever the situation demands. He said, come on, guys. Let, let's finish this conversation. So in Luke 9, he began to talk to them. He said, all right, you know who I am. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. A lot of us are following a lot of stuff, but is it Christ? Let's look at that scripture again. Can you, can we, let's look at it again. If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. Whose cross are you taking up? Whose cross are you taking up? Your cross. You're not taking up Jesus' cross. Am I reading the Bible wrong? Take up his cross. If it was Jesus' cross, it'd be a capital and it's lowercase. All of us have a cross that we got to pick up. He said, come after me. You know what come after me? It doesn't mean I'm following after Jesus. You got your little tambourine following him, talking about everything he's done. No, he said, come after me means to come into who I created you to be. It's not just movement, but it's based on who I created you to be. And he said, deny yourself. And I know about denying yourself, fasting and praying. But it's denying every cultural perception of what you should be and what things are around you and accepting the identity of Christ, denying what my failures tell me are, what I am, or even my ideas, because I'm glad that God didn't let me live out my dreams. I'm glad I took his dreams and his will for my life because he funds his vision, and I'm in the greatest place that I'll ever be because I'm in the will of God. Does that make sense in here? If I would have followed my dreams, I would have stayed in Philadelphia and had a church there, and it would, I would have been in a majorly big city. But here's the thing. I'd have never met you. I'd have never had the wonderful experience to say welcome to Believer's Faith Fellowship yes, where you can define your destiny, develop in your purpose, and discover your potential. I didn't know none of that stuff until I said yes. Many of us are waiting on God to reveal the full picture, but God is waiting on our yes. And when you get in that time, he'll reveal to you everything you need to know. He said, take up your cross daily. Your cross is not Jesus' cross. Your cross is your purpose. But we all have a cross to bear as we're following Jesus. So you are not coming to our own by denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following, just follow me here, Jesus. The second part is, uh, you got to involve others. Luke 9, 23, he said to all, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus developed followers long after his death. Because of his cross, because of what he did on the cross, you and I can live out our purpose. He involved others in his purpose and mission in life. You and I are to do the same thing. Let me bust a myth in your head. Someone said that leadership is a lonely journey. But a leader without followers is just a person taking a walk. Who are you leading? Leadership development is lonely. Because there are things that God does on the private and in confidential moments of your life. While you even following, there's things that God is developing you as a leader that you really can't describe. You cannot articulate. You can't even say, but God's working something inside of you. But he's doing this so you can gather people. Every leader needs to be a gatherer. And here's what uh, leaders and people of God are you in this room. You got to start to love people. I don't do people. You got to love people. I'm going to keep saying that until they get in your spirit. Come in your hands and say, I don't do people. You got to love people. You cannot minister to what you do not love. Say that, I love people. Say, I love God and I love people. I ain't saying nothing about like. Like changes by the day. 
I love people. What stirs me up is seeing what's inside of you and what God wants to do. That's why I can celebrate with you when you go through stuff, when you experience stuff, when you life happens. I love people. Look at the cross. Jesus' cross is vertical and it's horizontal. There's a connection to him vertical, but there's also a horizontal connection you got to have with people. Your formation as a leader develops you. Who likes salt and vinegar potato chips in here? I done lost my, I I forgot to get my example. I was going to give you all back. But anybody who eats salt and vinegar potato chips, what do you need to go along with them? Why? Because they make you thirsty. You got to have water to go with your chips. You are the salt of the earth, and your life ought to make somebody thirsty. You mean God is doing that in your life? What? Fill me up till I overflow. He filled you up, and I know you used to walk around timid. If he can do it for you, fill me up till I overflow. And I want it to run over. My, I feel that. God, your life is to make other people thirsty and to get people to follow hard after God. So you got to involve others. Then you got to live with ingenuity. Ingenuity is the quality of being clever, original, and inventive. This scripture, when I was reading this, and then the word popped in my head while I was reading it, and I said, what are you saying, God? Verse 924 says, whoever will save his life will lose it. I said, now, you just told me to tell people don't lose their eye. He said, that's not what I'm telling you to give yourself away. He said, your life, your mission, give it away. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Save, when you save your own life, you know what it literally means to play it safe? To hold it in. I'm not going to take any risk. I'm not going to take any chances. I'm good at being saved, just me and Jesus, for fear of if I actually pray for somebody and they don't get healed, they're going to question God as if it's your power. If I really tell people that, you know, I really, I'm, man, my, I flow in the gifts of the Spirit, but I'm still human, I got stuff going on, they're going to question the anointing. No. It is living all out with an abandon that if God can save somebody like me, surely he can save anybody. It's not fear of looking stupid. Man, it's not fear. Man, lose, you lose your life in worship. You know what it looks like? Man, if you want to come up here to the altar, lift your hands, worship. Don't worry about who's looking at you. Man, if you want to say amen while I'm preaching, I appreciate it. Yes, <laughs> say a couple more. Yeah. Man, if you want to see God move through you, losing your life is not worried about the perception that you have of people that people may have of you. It's not worried about being wrong or stupid. It's a word about falling hard at the right of God, You know the will of God. You know, I've seen God bless my mistakes because I wasn't trying to get it wrong. I'm trying to follow after his will. And I've seen God's hand come in with his grace and mercy. To lose your life means to live with an abandon by faith and not living by fear. Um, I wish I I took French. Am I taking a foreign language in high school or college? I I don't, merci beaucoup. I think I remember a couple words in French. I don't even know if I put them together right. Bonjour. There are many of you in here that God wants to teach you a, a second language, that he wants to be your dominant language. How many here speak English? But there's another language that God wants to teach you. In the spirit, he wants you to start speaking faith because many of us speak doubt and we speak it fluently. But he wants us to learn to speak faith. He wants us to lose our life. And to, listen, I'm going to just put it all out there. God, this is what you said. I'm going to throw caution to the wind. I'm going to trust you. And you're going to back it up with your word because you said it. So with that, I begin to challenge myself and I want to challenge you. Um, I'm going to start inviting people just randomly to church. I walk through Walmart, and I'd be looking like, where do they go to church? I hear Joe B. Jackson. I'd be seeing kids walk over from the apartments, and i said, wait a minute. There's a bunch of kids back there? Wait a minute. I see needs in the I said, man, we can, we can address these needs. So I think I'm going to just start, and I want you all to follow with me. I want to just start randomly. Man, if Jesus is as good as we say he is, I'm going to start telling people about it. All right. They may not uh, follow it. I was with somebody, and they prayed. We were at the, uh, the table getting ready to eat, and Pastor Mike Pats, when he was here, and I'm going to start doing that. And I started, and it works. The server came up to the table, and uh, they said, they brought us our food. He said, hey, we're getting ready to pray for our food. Can we pray for you? And the young man turned red. I said, oh, here we go. <laughs> he said, you have no idea. This has been one of the worst days. I, I'm in graduate school with David Liscomb, and I'm trying to save money to get there. Can you please pray that God will help me with my anxiety and that I can work and do everything he's called me to do? Man, he grabbed hands with us, and we locked at that table. We were at, eating at... Uh, Miller's down there, and I asked the lady that came up to us, I'm going to try Jesus. If I look stupid, I didn't look stupid. 
They don't want me to pray. Well, I just pray when they leave. Man, that lady put her hand on my shoulder and she said, yes, I need you to pray for this. And she just kept coming out with stuff. You would be surprised what would happen when you step out of your comfort zone. I asked you to pray for somebody earlier. How many of you be honest to say when you came in, your faith may not have been always where you needed to be? But your faith is built after you pray. Because I don't pray in the name of Jason. I don't pray in the name of Miss Lois. I don't pray in the name of Carrie. I pray in the name of Jesus. And when I say that name, authority and power show up. So I'm going to take that ingenuity and I'm going to lose my life. I'm going to lose my life like Jesus said, because Jesus lost his life. And let me show you what happened. He got a name that was above every name. Ephesians 2 and 4 said, let each one of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Yes, I ha and have this mind among you, which is, is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count it equality with, a, uh, with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, yes, being born in the likeness of men. He was God in flesh, but he said, I'm going to go be a man. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death. On, you do know that Jesus could have saved himself. While they were them little, them little guys down there casting lots for his clothes. Gabriel. You ever had some friends with you <laughs> that know somebody? They just, just say the word. We got them. Them angels were in heaven like Jesus. If you just... Some of y'all got some knuck if you buck friends. <laughs> they make, ooh, you don't know. You know what we did to Lucifer. <laughs> we didn't even fight him. The Bible said we beheld him as lightning. That quick he was gone. He said, therefore, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because of Jesus' obedience, because he lived with ingenuity, because he lost his life, he got a name above every name. If you'll lose your life, just get, I mean, I'm, just give your mission away. Just so, just give whatever God said does. There is a promotion coming to you, just like he did for Jesus. Influence others. I'm a little over my time. You guys all right here? Influence others is the other way, the other versatility thing. He said, for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits his soul? Before you get to the last part, lose your soul. He didn't say don't gain the world. He said gain it. Just don't lose your soul in the process. We want to win the world for Jesus and to make him famous. And I, your success has to come with a successor. Jesus' success, I am his successor. And in everything you do, there has to be a successor. We're getting ready to start this thing uh, at church uh, called Swagged Out Wednesdays, where we bring all of our teens in here, and they're going to have their own service, and it's not going to look like this. It's going to be loud. They're going to be chanting. They're going to be dancing. They're going to be doing things that younger people do. But I have made it a mission to God that this generation will not be lost in the culture that is counter of what God says. We will not walk around these little corny little people, but we will walk around as men and women of God of influence who know who we are at a young age and will create a culture where they can come and serve God with an abandon. Someone asked me, um, and MTSU and young adults, we're coming next for you. Someone asked me, do you think this generation will see revival? And I said, I believe God, and I believe it's happening right now. I said, the challenge is, this is Jason Scales, and you can uh, argue with me. I'm not sure that revival will look just like it looked in times past. In times past, uh, people threw great revivals and people ran to the church. They ran to the church and they were healed and I think healing all this stuff will happen. Instead of a them come to us revival, I believe the revival that's going to happen is an us go to the world. I believe the revival is not going to happen just in church, but it's going to happen in the marketplace. I believe that God is raising up people in media, in entertainment, in business who go in various parts of the world and apply pressure. And we're going to see revivals start to spring up, not just in houses of faith, but in marketplace, in the economy, in the government. We're going to see it. Revival is not just going to be, come with me on Sunday. We got the guest evangelist. He's praying for people and fingers are growing and people are getting good teeth and all this stuff like that. You're going to be able to do it on your job. 
and you're going to be able to lay hands and figure out an algebraic equation in the same breath. You're going to be able to lay hands and be able to balance a budget and make wise decisions because I believe our influence is going to spread greater than here. I think it's time out for the people of God to be great in here and not great out there. I think the same influence we walk with in here, we got to walk with out there. Y'all right in here? Revival is here. The closing is this. He said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses and forfeits himself? Notice Jesus didn't say don't gain the world. He said, just don't do it and lose your eye, your versatility. Life will beat on you. But he said, I want you to keep your versatility, your identify with the right thing, be influenced, uh, influence people, involve people in your life, live with ingenuity. He said, Jesus picked up his cross, and years later, we're still singing about an old rugged cross yes, where Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me, his impact. And we live because, because of the cross, we have access to God. Yes. Now, because we serve Jesus through that cross, he said, pick up your cross and follow me. I'll close with this question. Jesus' cross impacted generations, and it still has power. What impact will you have by picking up your cross? Yeah. I've done two funerals over the past two weekends. When your funeral, Jesus doesn't come back, he saves his coming, what would they say about your mission? What would they say about what you did with your life? I think you should drive nice. I think you should live light, nice and think you should do all those things. But what impact have you made by being versatile? I want something to stir so inside of you that you go out and say, what can I do to change my family and this world? Because I picked up my cross and I followed Jesus. I don't know about you, but I want to leave an impact when I go out. Man, I want to say that man lived and things change because of him. He ain't always get it right. You know, you celebrate people when they die. You act like everything in their life was perfect. No, but he followed after God. He was bent on serving his master. What would they say about you? Accomplish a lot. But have you sold out to what Christ wants to do in your life? Have you said, yes, use me wherever I am? I know you're going to take care of me, but I want you to use me in an incredible way. Stand to your feet all over the building. I want you to make a decision in here of the impact you're going to make in life. Many of you are at that point where you sold out. Many of you are point where you're reserved and you're consumed with your, yourself. And all you, you should take care of yourself. But I want to challenge you in this room today to sell out online in this room to Jesus. And I'm going to let you, let you make a declaration today. If you're in here today and you say, you know what, God? I want to sell out to your plan for my life so that I can be versatile, never lose my eye, and be effective for you in every situation. But here's my yes. If you're giving God your yes today, can you lift your hands and surrender to God? Yes. Yes. Many of you will go and do, I mean, we'll hear about you all around the world. But it started from this yes. You'll touch people that we never imagined. You'll be in places that, man you, man, you have no clue what God's about to do in your life. But it all starts with this yes. And as you get it, success won't destroy you, neither will your failures, because you know who you are in the name of Jesus. So, Father, as we close, I close this sermon out. Our prayer to you is yes. Matter of fact, I'm not even going to, I want you to pray your yes prayer to God. If you want to come to this altar and pray, you want to kneel at your seat, you want to sit down and pray, I want you to pray a prayer to God and to surrender to him. Do it all over the building right now. Come on, pray. Use me. God, I'm too opinionated. I want to follow hard after you. Change my language so I speak faith. Use me. Come on, pray, saints. Pray. Father, here's my prayer. If you, all of the wealth of heaven, you can flow it through me because you can trust me. Everything you want to do, you can trust me. Flow influence through me. 
Let me, I, God, you can trust me to do what you have put in my hand to do by faith. Yes, God. And Father, I repent for every time you told me to step out in faith and I yes. talk myself out of it in fear. Every time you said do something and I knew it was you and I didn't do it, Father, forgive me. Yes, God. Father, forgive me. For every person you told me to go and ask that they know you and to pray for them. And I didn't do it. Forgive me. I know you always send somebody else. For every time you told me to sow and I didn't sow, forgive me. I'm going to do it in season, what you're asking me to do. In Jesus' righteous and wonderful name we pray. Come on. Talk to him. I feel some of you pulling on God. Come on, talk to him. Come on, this is your moment. And as you do that, you're going to feel your anointing start to increase. Joy. Your sense of purpose. Some of you, the lethargic nature is going to come off of you because you're living for something now. Bigger than you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's put our hands together and bless God all over the building.